All right. I'm going to go ahead and kick us off. Kalinda, thank you for helping with the chat. I really appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. My name is Vicki Maris. I am an assistant director in the Stair Center for Executive Education at the University of Notre Dame. The Stair Center is within the Mendoza College of Business. We are getting ready here for a webinar number two here in the series. And uh, Dr. Pete Delisle is here with us. Hi, Pete. Uh, we thank you so much for doing this webinar for us. Folks, we have, um, again, oversubscribed the webinar. So you are in the company of about 100 other people. And I thank you so much for registering for this free event. This whole series of eight webinars on Wednesdays, it's our way of reaching out to connect with you and to bring you some of our most wonderful faculty. And each one of them have topics that they can share that are helpful to each of us as we're dealing with these really difficult times uh, that have resulted because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, Kalinda and I want to say on behalf of all of our coworkers and the other faculty at Notre Dame that we all wish you uh, the best and we all hope you are safe and well and that your family members are the same and that uh, we've been praying for each of you as I did last week, I did again this morning. I have scrolled through the list of names of people who are registered and have prayed over each one of your names. It is such a wonderful testament to your interest in being a great leader that you are here. I'm going to go over to the slides and bring those up. So I'll be sharing my screen here and I'm going to do a very short little uh, brief intro of Pete because we want him to get right to his subject matter. The topic today is uh, foresight, the Paredes Principle. And uh, Pete's gonna dig into that a little bit further. Uh, Kalinda and I are, will be uh, kind of trimming up the recordings of these videos, and then we'll be posting them on our YouTube channel that we have set aside just for the webinar recordings. So. As a registrant of this webinar, you will be hearing from me in the future with a URL that you can use to access the recording of this webinar, as well as the one last week, if you missed the one last week. Uh, the instructors who are teaching, like Pete, are all members of our uh, Faculty for Certificate in Executive Management. And the uh, program that is coming up that at least uh, we would like to confidently say it's coming up uh, will be our September module that is in uh, sep uh, it's called leading the strategic enterprise that's one of four modules in this program so you'll be hearing from some instructors from uh, various modules uh, several of them are uh, te who teach in our module one which is called leadership essentials and Pete teaches in that module he has a uh, a very interesting background. He has worked in industry. He has uh, been in an HR position with Hewlett Packard. He has uh, worked for a startup. He's been at the University of Illinois in the uh, College of Engineering as a professor. So just all kinds of interesting aspects to Pete's background. He has many wonderful stories and he teaches for us at the University of Notre Dame in a number of our programs, including our uh, executive MBA, as well as this program certificate in executive management and uh, several others. So it's just my joy to say, Pete, take it away. So glad you are here. And each one of you who have joined us, thank you for being here. And uh, we'll, uh, Kalinda and I will be watching the chat. And as you have some questions, we'll try to get those relayed to Pete. So thank you, Pete. Hello, Vicki. And hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, it's a true pleasure to have an opportunity to spend some time with you this afternoon. Um, we had a, a wonderful chat last week with a number of your friends and colleagues, and I think some of you might have joined us then. And today we're gonna continue our conversation about leader, leader effectiveness. Um, and as a result of that, I wanted to focus on one thing that seemed to be uh, significantly important in our prior conversations, and that this is this idea of foresight. When I talk about the ability to lead, I talk about that people need to be influential. They need to be able to influence people with or without authority. 
but they also need to be able to make decisions that are consequential and in some cases make decisions that are not in their self-interest but are, if you will, the right thing to do. And then the final, final element in the ability to lead is foresight. So you can see here, um, I've tried to describe this on slides and many of the slides have a lot of information and they're relatively dense. So I'll go through those quickly, but just by way of highlight, foresight is, is a, a central ethic of effective leadership. And it's not about predicting the future, by the way. It's about uh, taking time. And of course, we don't have enough time ever to, to truly do this as much as or as effectively as we want to, but we must take the time to think about what might happen in the future. So as we move forward here, looking at the next slide, I'm interested in, in talking with you about this ability to lead that is significant. And as you see here, it's the ability to perceive the significance and nature of events before they've occurred. And then the chart, of course, based upon those perceptions. And, or it's, it's a better than average guess. But in fact, in this particular circumstance, what I'm gonna to suggest to you is this is a critical skill that we must develop and sustain over time. And so I'm gonna to try to describe a little bit more about the elements of foresight. And in the next slide, what you're going to see is a little bit of the edge of this thing as well, because leader effectiveness to me is critically important. And so as an ethic of leadership, uh, this comment comes to us from Daniel Kim, who wrote a, a lovely pamphlet uh, from the Harvard Business School and the Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership. If you want the reference, I'm happy to pass that to you. But it, it, in, in essence, what it's saying is, if you're in a position of responsibility, and you fail to take the time to think about what might happen if, and if something goes wrong, as opposed to holding people on station at that time solely responsible for the negative outcome, we truly ought to be go, going back literally upstream, if you will, and finding those people who fail to take the time to think through the problem and actually hold them accountable as well. As we go forward here, I'm gonna to try to talk through that and give you some illustrations of how that might happen, but I'm, I'm introducing something that I, I love to talk about, and in this case, uh, Vicki, I'll use my, my uh, high school Latin, we'll call this the Paratus Principle. And in this particular case, I think it's a unique ability to respond to complex, ambiguous events and discontinuities in an expert fashion, immediately, successfully, as a result of exercising foresight. Now, at this particular moment in time, uh, you can make your own list about complex, ambiguous, and discontinuous circumstances and situations. The real question we have to ask ourselves is how prepared are we to deal with these things? So let's go forward. I'll, I'd like to give you some illustration of where this came from. I borrowed this principle from a, 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 an armed service that I admire greatly. And it's the, it's the extreme preparedness that's demonstrated by the Coast Guard, whose motto is, is Semper Paratus, and the translation in this case is always ready. And I'll go back to uh, some other perspectives from the Coast Guard as well. But, the, but their whole principle is we've got to be prepared to do these things and we able to, have to be able to respond in an expert fashion because literally people's lives are depending upon us. So that's where the Paratus principle comes from. Go to the next slide, please. So there are conditions, I think, that preclude or thwart foresight. I'm going to talk with you about a couple of those, but these are the ones that popped into mind almost immediately. So. Uh, I think it's important sometimes to be able to describe a circumstance or situation because it gives you a, a, the ability to communicate that information forward to people as opposed to just anecdotally. But in this particular case, internal invisibility means a person can't or doesn't want to see uh, the forest through the trees. Um, you can, again, uh, supply your own imagery in that particular area. It's also something called functional fixedness, which means a closed systems. By the way, hierarchies oftentimes are closed systems where they put people in a position where they are, are unauthorized to move within the hierarchy and as a result, oftentimes information is suppressed. And it also it causes people to just rely on past practice like the over justification effect because the attitude that many people have is, well, you know, it's always worked in the past. Why would we wanna make any changes? Which then of course leads us to a phenomenon called tunneling. Uh, you know, tunneling of course is if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I, I go back and I think about this, and that is with internal invisibility, I doubt seriously that Blockbuster cares whether or not you return that DVD that was hidden somewhere for the last six or seven years. I mentioned the hierarchy in terms of the closed systems. That's problematic because it's inflexible and oftentimes brittle. Um, 
playing on past success isn't going to work. And truth be told, and this probably is going to sound like heresy, but when we, we take a look at tunneling, uh, you know, now from a business school, sometimes the, the profit motive and or shareholder value is an illustration of tunneling. And it causes us to make decisions that aren't necessarily responded to the true nature and conditions that exist in the circumstance we find ourselves in. So as we go forward and we start taking a look at other issues here. Another one, another illustration is this idea of path dependence. Okay. And you've done stuff in the past, it's worked. And so, you know, the cliches are, well, we've always done it this way. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Everybody knows. And of course, my favorite is when you gather a group of people together for a new enterprise and they came from other cultures and other organizations where their son of values, oftentimes people resort to, well, when I was at, and then you'll hear the story of what they did in their past life, oftentimes in a very successful organization or enterprise, but truthfully, it has absolutely no bearing on the actual nature of the problem or situation that people are finding themselves in at that particular moment in time. And it just throws things into a state of conflict and stall. There's another phenomenon in, in the, uh, the, the, the situations that preclude or thwart foresight, and that one is called uh, Cassandra complex. So if we could go to the next slide here. Thanks. So Cassandra was the daughter of Priam, the king of Troy. And, you know, the backstory is Cassandra was an extraordinarily effective and intelligent person. Um, she was given, therefore, the boon of foresight, or in this particular case, the ability to predict the future. Um, colloquially, she basically hacked off her patrons, the gods, and so they doomed her to always tell the truth and to have no one believe her. So in this particular case, as you see here, you know, one of the biggest issues with foreseeing the future you know, and the practice of visioning is we never really get people to consolidate on that. And oftentimes people head off in their own directions with their own interpretation of what the vision is. But here lies the problem, and that is sometimes people have really clear imagery that they present to people about what might happen if, like foresight, okay? And they can it literally can articulate circumstances and situations that may evolve as you start to see this array of activity that isn't necessarily apparent to everybody else, but they can kind of sort of see it and they get it and they'll make an assessment of the thing, or maybe they have an expert uh, capacity to make this kind of an assessment. And yet people reject it because it doesn't fit the way they think the world's going to actually operate. Uh, a tragic um, and, and complex example of that would be um, Army Chief of Staff Eric Shinseki, who was asked at the onset of the Iraq war, uh, what he thought the problems were going to be, how long and how many soldiers. And he said, prior to any deployment, that it was going to take at least three to 400,000 soldiers for 15 and probably 15 years if we went into Iraq and Afghanistan. That's an example of a Cassandra because people pushed him aside. And of course, you know the rest of the story. Another uh, condition that thwarts or precludes is called a black swan. Now, in, on the next slide, you'll see a black swan. And I wanted to illustrate this because everybody knows that swans are white, right? Until you see a black swan. And so in this case, a black swan is something that occurs that nobody ever anticipated or thought could ever occur because normality would say that will never happen. But of course, the, the situation does emerge. It has some severe, in many cases, catastrophic consequences. And they're very, very rare. They're very severe. And yet, when we look back, people will suggest, wow, we should have seen that coming, okay? And so an example of a black swan, as we look back in history, uh, and again, it, it's a grim example, is, is the, uh, the devastation of the city of New Orleans and the Gulf Coast as a result of Katrina and Rita. And of course, as we look back to New Orleans, which has not quite ever, or will ever recover from the storms, we find that people actually had told the local officials and the state officials that the levees, which were holding back the onslaught of water, were actually unsafe three years before the disaster, okay? And we should have exercised foresight to deal with that, but of course the black swan was, who would have ever thought that all that would have happened simultaneously? And you can think of other examples, of course, of situations at this particular moment in time where perhaps we're seeing the, uh, the evidence of a black swan. We should have seen it come and we didn't. Now, as we go forward with this idea of the Protest Principle, let me just give you an operating definition, if I may. So if we go to the next slide, please. 
okay? And what I mean by an operating definition is this. It's the ability to respond in an expert fashion, as I made, a little, made mention a little while ago. Herein lies the problem, though. Th those behaviors, either positive foresight or the things that thwart or preclude foresight, and as a result, cripple any attempt to prepare for the future, are based upon the values and behaviors of organizations. And so with a very, very broad brush, I want to present to you two paradigms, if you will, uh, elegant Greek term meaning way of looking at the world, but in this case, we'll call them mental models. And a mental model could be an individual's way of looking at the world and or it could be a, a cultural phenomenon as well. And that is the organization or the company or the region or whatever might have a way of looking at the world that causes them to make decisions. And so the first, and by the way, there's, this is not evil or, or, or good, if you will. This is just the way people look at the world. And as I talk through this, you may uh, recognize some behaviors that that you exhibit that are like the mental models I'm going to describe. So it's all humanity and we're going to talk through it that way. So the first value uh, of a mental, the first mental model is win at all costs. And you know what that means. Uh, and again, colloquially, if you're not a winner, you're a loser. Okay. And so, you know, what does this mean? You know, if you've had teenagers around you understand that means loser. Uh, Hands up is a big loser. Uh, this this uh, this way of demonstrating it is a three dimensional loser. Because anyway, you look at me, I'm a loser. Uh, and of course, again, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but for the fact that when it all costs means that you will do virtually anything to ensure that you're a winner. And of course, when the world is binary with winners and losers, that can create a problem. But the real issue with when it all costs is that the at all costs, which means you may suspend any sense of propriety or ethical behavior because winning is paramount. The next governing value of this first mental model is always control everything. And again, colloquially, if you're not in control, you're, you're, out, you're out of control. And, you know, most people think that that's a sign of, of uh, weakness on your particular part and there, therefore you're a loser. So you could even argue that those two behaviors kind of feed on each other. They dovetail each other. And, you know, the, the issue is, is not control. I mean, obviously, we need things to be under control. But the, the question, therefore, then becomes, can you always control? And the answer is generally no. And can you control everything? And the answer is generally no. So putting all three of those elements together, you can see that that can be problematic, especially if someone uh, conceives in their own mind that the only way they're going to be a winner is because they're in control. You know, I, I remember a wonderful illustration where I overheard a couple of managers walking down the hall and one turned to the other and said, you know, my numbers are completely out of control. And what would be the assumption? And that was uh, obviously there's something wrong and the person's a loser. But later on, I found when I approached the individual, they said, you know, my project came in under budget, under time, and it's very successful, but it's not the way I planned it. And so I was out of control. And so that's a, a different way of thinking about what control means. But normally we think that always being in control is critically important. And then the last one is, is much more complex because it has uh, multiple dimensions to it, uh, but never lose face is problematic. And of course it fits within this first mental model. Uh, and face itself is, is intriguing. And, you know, in, in, in cultures it has profound uh, impact, if you will. Uh, I'm gonna suggest that in kind of middle America, uh, losing face or would be something like, hey, you know, you got a problem with me. Tell me about it before you go into the meeting. Uh, you know, don't lay it out in the meeting. Don't embarrass me. I mean, we're friends and colleagues. You know, you got my back, right? And people say, yeah, no worries. I'll, I'll take care of things. And of course, the problem with that is that sometimes we'll go into a meeting and you'll have material information that's important. The decision's being made, but because it's going to make your colleague look stupid, you hold that information back, kept faith with that person, uh, but of course, cause people perhaps to make a decision with incomplete information. And of course, that's problematic as well. And that's kind of the uh, middle America light version of face. But as I understand, as I talk with my friends of different cultures, face is everything. It's, in, it's integrity. Uh, it's a sense of honor. And were someone to lose face, not only would they dishonor their family, but they would dishonor all their ancestors and all their antecedents if they were foolish enough to sustain their own life. Uh, and or if someone in the family causes the family to lose face, 
it's problematic well past the point of being disappointed or frustrated. It could lead to, in fact, existential risk for people. So I present mental model one, if you will, to you here. And this is, like I said, this, this is the way people behave. It's, it's okay. You know, I can hear some of this in my own conversations with my teenage daughters 20 years ago, where I wanted them at home at the right time, you know? Um, and it, it can, can create some cascading problems, especially if all three of these things are at play at the same time. Uh, but I want you to keep this in mind as we start to think about the organization, the individual leader and or the organization's ability to actually confront the circumstances that they're encountering and or uh, the will to engage in foresight to prepare for circumstances and situations. And so the, the second mental model actually lends itself to a higher probability of people being able to successfully engage in foresight and or look toward the, the circumstances of what if in order to prepare for those types of things. So the next slide will show another mental model. And this is not, again, it's not goodness or evil or whatnot. It's just different. But I think as I talk through this, you might be able to see that the second model is actually more challenging um, and riskier for people. But this is leader behavior. And I want you to keep that in mind as I talk through it. Because the first dominant value of this mental model is open and honest inquiry. The key word is inquiry. It means asking questions. You're attempting to find out. You're open. And of course, being open is risky because you might find out something you really don't want to know. Okay, and honest means you tell the truth. And I talk oftentimes about intellectual honesty, which is being honest about being honest. And so this particular value talks about you're trying to discover things, you're intellectually honest, and you're asking questions. You know, one of my favorite Mark Twain quotes I mentioned, I think the other day was, um, is uh, Mark Twain said, you know, if you never lie, you never have to remember what you said to anybody. And that, that works for me because at my age, my memory's a little shot and so I have to tell the truth because well, anyway you get my point. The next value associated with this mental model is free and informed choice. Okay so choice is the critical issue here and that means you can say yes or you can say no. You're free to say yes or no. There is no reprisal but there are consequences and informed means that based upon inquiry you have essentially all the information that's possible for you to gather at that moment in time. Okay and then therefore you move forward. So just like in the other mental model, win at all costs and, and always control everything and never lose face, tend to dovetail on each other and are interdependent as such. Uh, inquiry and choice are interdependent as well. And then the last element here of this particular model, advocacy with continuing inquiry suggests uh, this, and this is where uncertainty plays in and it causes people, and by the way, can you, can you hear like a gravitational force field pulling pulling us back to model one because we don't want to look stupid because advocacy with continuing inquiry means that you're, 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 you're going you're gonna to go in on something. You're going to say, I think this is what we ought to do. Okay. But the continuing inquiry means that you leave the channels of communication open because if you start down a pathway, you say, you know, based upon what we know right now, I think this is the way we ought to go. But if new information pops up, I as the leader reserve the right to change my mind. And or we may have to go in exactly the opposite direction because the new information suggests to us that we're headed in the wrong direction. Now, again, can you hear like model one in the background going loser, out of control, guy stuffs in the street, because that's the natural behavior of most of us. We don't want us to look stupid. We don't want to feel like we're out of control. So as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, this particular way of looking at the world, it, it has, has some challenges and is risky. But the probability of being able to come up with better solutions to problems, I'm going to suggest to you, is, is, is significantly higher if we engage in this particular process. And I'll see if I can illustrate that as we go forward with the next slide. Because the way that we actually try to solve these problems going forward, and by the way, just to review the Paratus principle here, again, we're looking at the ability to respond to complex, ambiguous, discontinuous events in an expert fashion which means you know what to do, and that's as a result of actually having prepared to do it. Okay, so as we look forward here, there are some ways that are traditional, that come actually from past practice, successful past practice, and, and um, the first one is dialogue. And so dialogue loosely translated means you suspend judgment, and you sustain conversation long enough that you actually create meaning 
in the mind of the other person or persons. You actually want them to catch on. The key, of course, is suspending judgment. Don't, don't go limbered up here. You want to ensure that you talk through it long enough by asking questions that you actually cause the other person to actually catch on. And you can see the other two elements here are, you know, we're trying to solve a problem here. And of course, the way we work through this particular problem is by opening dialogue. Again, suspending judgment, sustaining conversation long enough that you create meaning in the mind of another person. As we go forward, I, I think I can give you some examples of this as well. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. So here's some things that, uh, that popped into my mind. The first recommendation I would make if we're finding ourselves in a situation where we need to demonstrate foresight, but we may be encountering some of those situations that might thwart or preclude our ability to actually present information like the black swan or the sand or path dependence or whatever it might be, is when you go into a situation where you need to talk through these things, first and foremost, disarm yourself. Okay, don't go in weaponized. Uh, I found a lovely quote from Socrates, who actually was the chief proponent in ancient Greek history of dialogue. And his comment was, I neither know nor think that I know. Now, once again, back to mental models, that means you may run the risk of looking stupid. But by virtue of the fact that you don't go in with preconceived ideas or a foregone conclusion, you can actually learn. And in that particular circumstance that you can make your decisions based upon useful information. One of my, one of my favorite expressions that undoubtedly you've heard as well, but it was first given to me by my, my first sergeant as a young officer in the army was, he suggested for me to use my ears in proportion to my mouth. And of course, you know, that was what I call the time bomb of wisdom, which means I didn't get it at the time, but later on it blew up in my face because he was gently suggesting I shut up and listen twice as much as I talk. The next element of dialogue in this case is learning how to ask really good questions that are not insubordinate and that are generally uh, trying to promote understanding on the part of the other person. The French word parler there uh, means to talk. And if we go back and look at various ways of illustrating how people try to solve problems, oftentimes they get together, disarm themselves and talk until they can actually come to a, a, at least a common understanding. And so in dialogue, we want to seek understanding, which essentially means we want to be, we want to understand the other person. So in many ways, our behavior in this context needs to be reversed in terms of its polarity. Because we want to understand what's going on with that other person or in that situation. And then in turn, we also want to be understood. So as we go forward here, there's a couple other things that I'd like you to give some thought to as well, looking at our next slide. So in this particular case, the Paratus principle means you gotta do something. And so here's a couple of thoughts that you can apply, I think, almost in, almost in real time to everyday kinds of problems. Because I'm a pragmatist, and hopefully there's a couple of things that make sense to you. The first thing I think we need to do is to acknowledge what's real. Okay, we don't, really, don't, we don't want to engage in magical thinking or the way we would like it to be. We have to acknowledge what's actually happening. And then based upon the things that are presented to you, you really need to make the best call you can, recognizing there's going to be uncertainty and ambiguity. And even if you've done a, an excellent job of preparing for the future, stuff happens because, you know, we can't predict the future. So we make the best call. We say, I think this is the way to go. And as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, but we need to have really short feedback loops. So we say to ourselves, look, if something else comes up and or if we discover something, we're going to feed that into our process here and ensure that our decisions are headed in the right direction. One of my favorite stories uh, as I was studying Katrina Rita uh, came from uh, Admiral Thad Allen, who was the uh, US Coast Guard officer responsible for the Coast Guard's response uh, to the Katrina Rita circumstances situation. And, and things weren't going particularly well. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the head of the Coast Guard called Admiral Allen and said, uh, I need you to go to New Orleans and see what you can do to help out. And Admiral Allen said in conversation that as he was going to the airport, he called up the dogs that hunt. Now that sounds a little demeaning or dehumanizing, but what he was doing, but, but, but the next statement that he made was, if, if you go and hunt, you better have some dogs that can hunt. Now that was his 
playful way of describing men and women he had worked with throughout his career that knew exactly what to do in a situation of high ambigu ambiguity and uncertainty. And his instructions were to them were, I'll be in New Orleans, find me. And if you recognize and reflect on the circumstances at the time, uh, that's all he had to do because they were prepared to respond in an expert fashion. But I thought that was a, a really simple and easy way to remember that what you really want to do when you're handling these kinds of problems is have people around you that get it, okay? And then nurture and develop those relationships so you can rely on them in the future as well. The next action I'm going to suggest is you find the flow and you go with it. Now, what that means is you know, I use oftentimes the analogy of whitewater rafting. First and foremost, if you're whitewater rafting in your category four water, which is very sporty, because category one water is your bathtub and category five is Niagara Falls. But in this case, you're in category four water, which means the river's in charge. And so what do you do? Well, you find the flow and you go with it. And hopefully you've got an expert resource in the person of a 17 or 18 year old guide who's done it two or 300 times, but probably not. And so what you wanna do is stay out of the holes and off the rocks and the river's in charge, you go with it which then leads us to this other recommendation is you control what you can and you let the rest go. You can't control everything. You can perhaps see now why that mental model I described actually creates a circumstance that might cause you to respond uh, with the wrong, wrong reflexes, if you will, or try to work a problem is, is, is not resolvable at that moment in time. You let it go. You deal with what you can actually deal with. And then the last element of this in dealing with complexity as it relates to foresight is, I, I'm gonna suggest that people find and keep and then exploit your sense of humor. Because when things seem to be completely out of control, sometimes being able to see um, you know, the, the absurdity, if you will, and I'm not trying to trivialize it, but being able to, to laugh through something and or create a, and sustain a sense of, of, of humor that enables people to take the situation deadly seriously, but temper it with, with some view of the irony of the circumstance, or maybe in, in plain spoke here, just tell a really good joke, sometimes changes the circumstance, the situation. So humor is part of this thing as well, in this list of things. As we go forward with trying to reflect on the Paratus principle here, ladies and gentlemen, there's a couple of things that I've seen uh, that just make good common sense in this particular circumstance. And I'll reflect on something I talked about the other day, which is something that uh, is, a, is a practice, a, a, lear a learned activity that has been fostered by the United States Army now for, uh, for virtually 40 years. And they actually have a Center for Lessons Learned, but their, uh, their statement for the Center for Lessons Learned or the practice of lessons learned is you're thinking forward and you're trying to figure out ways to align resources, as you see here, to, to deliver timely and relevant information but well, more importantly, fostering the readiness of the current organization and informing the future organization. Another quote that I think made tremendous sense, which by the way was from Malcolm X, who said the future belongs to those who prepare for it today. One of my favorite quotes from my General Bradley was, must chart our course by the stars, not the lights of every passing ship. Of course, Yogi Berra said, we're lost, but we're making good time. And, you, know, you wanted us just to get engaged in the process. And then last but not least, a quote from the, you know, those Coast Guardsmen to get in rescue boats to go out and save the lives of people that are on the verge of losing their lives because of the catastrophic circumstances of water and whatnot is their motto is, we've we got to go out. They don't have to come back, which actually is a testimony to the ethos of that group of people whose mission is to save lives. Those are some of my thoughts about this idea of the Paratus Principle. I'd like to stop right now and see if there are any questions that you might have or observations, because I'd like to learn with you and maybe you can give me some illustrations of some of those impediments to, to uh, foresight and or circumstances that might lend themselves to the practice of the Parado Principle uh, for you personally as a leader and maybe in way, by way of helping your organization be prepared, if you will, and be always ready. So. Let me stop here. And are there questions or thoughts, ladies and gentlemen? And Vicki, if you could help me uh, respond to those, I'd be grateful. So 
So I'm, I'm uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Can you hear me okay? As, okay. as we are uh, watching for anyone to type comment, and a comment is fine too, folks. If you don't have a question but would like to simply add to the conversation, please feel free to do that. Thank you. Pete, I was, I was thinking as you were mentioning, I'm not sure I've seen you use the uh, phrase dogs that hunt. <laughs> and, and that one stood out for me. Uh, I'll share just a quick thing. My, uh, I have a sister that loves to work with beagles and beagle packs out in Virginia. People like to hunt, uh, hunt rabbits, chase. It's basically they're chasing rabbits uh, from horseback. So it's like a slowed down version of fox hunting, uh, which would be done with a group of foxhounds. But whether or not you're working with a pack of beagles or a pack of foxhounds, I've seen those, both of those groups of dogs in action. What I'm fascinated about is they do what you were talking about. You know, they, they're really well trained. They know what they're in pursuit of, but they also at a quick command of the hunt master will group back up. They'll change course if the hunt master wants them to change course they'll come to a complete halt if the hunt master has said, hey, hey, friends, come back. We're going to stop the chase right now. Uh, so all of those things came to mind for me as you were using that phrase that a lot, of, a lot of qualities that we need in our teams around us in a time like this, that, that they're also listening well. Well, you know, I'd like everyone to consider uh, those trusted uh, colleagues that you, you have a likeness of mind with but you know, if you got into a, a jam and needed some expert resources to solve a problem, they not only take your phone call, but they'd literally be there for you. And I guess in this case, those would be the people we would, we would turn to to help. Yes. Oh, I'm yes. also seeing some, some, uh, some chat notes here. So William, let me see if I can respond to your comment about is the, you know, the, the perfect storm, which sadly has now turned into a cliche, as you point out, another cop out like a black swan. Well, once again, the perfect storm uh, it was a black swan in, in so many ways. Uh, the weather report actually saw the storms converging. I, I happen to live in, in New England, and so hurricanes are, you know, are a real circumstance that, uh, that we deal with. Um, but in, in, in the perfect storm in this particular case was you, could, you literally could see it coming, uh, and, uh, but nobody ever anticipated uh, the convergence of all those forces at the same time would create the, you know, the catastrophe of the actual storm that occurred. And of course, the, the drama of the movie was people thought that they could ride it out. And of course, to, to significant uh, uh, tragedy as a result of that particular thing. But perfect storm now, I think, kind of loses its, uh, its value when people use it for uh, circumstances or situations, because that, what it implies is that the, the information was there but the convergence was actually the black swan. Nobody thought it would be as bad as it actually was. Kind of like Hurricane Sandy, a number of other things as well. And, and if you want to respond, William, that would help me close the loop here. But Steve, your comment was, how do we evangelize to those around us to buy into these concepts? And as I was talking about dialogue, I, what I wanted to reflect upon is, there's a, certain, there's a certain amount of risk here. And the risk is, as you start asking questions, people get confused. As a matter of fact, sometimes in, in closed systems, which is one of the other uh, elements that I illustrated earlier, people don't like to talk about uncertainty. And more importantly, sometimes leaders who are, uh, are model one leaders, you know, got to control everything, don't want to look stupid, are folks that will shut down any kind of active conversation. And so the risk we run, if we can see uh, elements or circumstances that need to be considered, is to not only learn how to ask questions, but do so in such a fashion that we don't threaten those people and yet at the same time, a well-crafted question gives them the opportunity to be critically reflective at that moment in time. Um, and as a result, maybe pause. And really the pause is the way to begin the conversation. Now, with regard to quote evangelizing, uh, I'm gonna suggest that if you're responsible for organizations, especially as you're dealing with circumstances that, you know, that are emerging, that are complex, or you have encountered one of these discontinuities we're talking about, is that you as a leader say, hey, look, there's going to be situations here that are unanticipated. And as a matter of fact, we're going to try planning for some of these things right now. 
But you know, if, if we're finding ourselves in the midst of a situation here, we can't fall back. We got to go out, you know, nobody says we have to come back. And by doing so, set the tone for people to say, it's okay for us to deal with ambiguity and uncertainty. If we're outside the bounds of what we're prepared for, we can learn from that. Let's ensure that we are authentic about that and ensure we respond effectively and do the best we possibly can in the situation we find ourselves in. So as a leader, you can set that up as a set of values and behaviors. And again, looping back to our earlier conversation here, if you can embrace those behaviors that I described in, in the second mental model, you know, open and honest inquiry, free and informed choice, advocacy with continuing inquiry, and then consistently use those as ways of, in, in, you know, uh, allowing your people to realize that a sign of wisdom in this particular case, and more importantly, effective leadership, is recognizing we have to be responsive to the situations as they actually exist. And hopefully, um, hopefully that works. By the way, the downside, of course, is they, they ask Socrates to kill himself. Um, he was the chief proponent of dialogue. So there is a, there is a real risk associated with this as well. We have a, a few questions and comments that have come in in our Q&A section. I'm going to read sure. off a couple of those, and then we can go back over to the chat, okay? Thanks. That'd be great. Uh, Thanks. The first one is a comment uh, from one of our anonymous attendees. Uh, find and keep a sense of humor is a good point. It reminds me of Lincoln, who was known as a storyteller even in the worst of times. Helped to keep sanity and level-headedness and break the stress, perhaps. And then, That's a wonderful statement. Thank you. And we have a, a question from uh, Kitty Campbell, friend of mine here in the Lafayette area. Hi, Kitty. Uh, do you have any examples for how we might have been prepared for the unanticipated circumstances we now find ourselves in due to COVID-19? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that and might, I'd say that, let's open that up to the chat. We might have some people in the chat that would also like to respond. Well, um, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to comment that in the context of our preparedness, if I may. And I wanna strip away any in insinuation that I'm making a political statement here. So please ensure that I recognize and understand that. It, it occurs to me as I've paid attention to, uh, to the circumstances as they've unfolded, was that there were actually were agencies uh, within the federal government whose full-time mission was to develop the preparedness for these kinds of circumstances and situations. Um, and, and could have or may have responded in an expert fashion, but those particular agencies uh, were not top of mind for many people. And so uh, had, this is wishful thinking, now. it's not magical thinking, it's wishful thinking. Had those agencies been in place, uh, we might have had a more expert response quicker than the current circumstance we find ourselves in. The other uh, lessons learned here are, uh, I don't know that we have seen evidence that those agencies uh, whose full-time mission is to respond to these circumstances and catastrophic failure uh, are, are any better prepared they were than as we go back and look at the, you know, this, the awful circumstances surrounding Katrina Rita, which is the example that I used. And we saw that FEMA really didn't have the ability to respond. On a positive note, uh, those organizations who have this sense of readiness were able to step up. And I'm, you know, I'm proud as I've heard reports of, of the men and women that served their country through the National Guard, that they've been able to step in and pr provide expert resources uh, in, while they encounter the actual situations as they're evolving, ranging from everything from building field hospitals to, uh, to going into act as intermediaries for COVID testing and those types of things. And so we do have the capacity to do this. The opportunity missed was that we didn't have the resources aligned that had existed that may have been able to deal with the situation uh, in an expert fashion uh, immediately. So hopefully that's a reasonable statement here without doing any deeper dive into that. We have, thank you, Pete. Uh, we have a question from Jose Luis, um, who was in our uh, Certificate in Executive Management program uh, in the past uh, year or so, he says, hello, I think it's important to build confidence between your teammates first. This will open the communication channel and will set up, set up the base to receive and make questions for any topic 
What do you think about experts not being open to receive critics? Well, uh, two things. In, 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 in Jose Luis, in your comment, you also mentioned trust, I believe. And I'm going to suggest to you that a leader, the, the, the fundamental leader behavior that dictates people's willingness and ability to respond to you effectively is whether they trust you or not. And of course, trust is based upon being open and honest and, and making assessments based upon emerging information and be willing to make change. And so when someone who uh, portends to be an expert is unwilling to hear information that relates to the nature of the changing situation or rejects information that doesn't fit their mental model, if you will, I think that's, uh, that's uh, the absence of foresight and or the absence of responsiveness. And I think we could argue that's one of those unethical behaviors that we talked to, I talked about with you as we first started this conversation. Hopefully that helps a little bit. We've still got some more time. Shall we go forward? I see Ty's comment, if I may uh, turn to the Zoom chat. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah, uh, Ty is one of our past participants who has completed certificate. Hi, Ty. Hi, Ty, thanks. Um, you know, I think that our problem oftentimes, especially with tunneling, and I'll reflect now on, on, on relative, you know, 40 years of, as a professional, is that we tend to be reasonably unsophisticated about dealing with complexity. And so we, we grab onto one idea, and we think that, uh, as you point out in your comment here, Ty, that, um, you know, the, as I said, the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And there are some pretty strong implications of that to the resiliency and the responsive capacity of an organization. The other dilemma that occurs is that when we just focus on one thing, tunneling being one of those aspects, is that we tend to preclude any information that doesn't fit with that flavor of the month, in your words here. Uh, and as a result, we, we fail to see emerging trends and activities uh, that would have a direct bearing on the work we're trying to do. We kind of shut off all extraneous information that doesn't fit the way we look at things. And there's evidence to show that organizations that fail to do that actually over time go out of business. Sometimes they go out of business quickly. Sometimes they go out of business over time like a slow death. Uh, but if you, if you go back into the last century, for example, uh, once upon a time, uh, in the, before the internet, companies thought that the way you precluded everybody from, uh, from uh, responding to competitive forces was to basically lock everybody out. That was called proprietary operating systems. Now, in that generation, it was computers not being able to talk to each other. 10 years, maybe 15 years later, it was cell phones not being able to talk to other species of cell phones. But because people got so locked into their view of the world, they found themselves in a situation where they became un, um, unable to respond to new information as it presented itself. And so uh, with, with respect, at one point in time, IBM led in the personal computing marketplace, but because of the advent of open systems and their subscription to proprietary systems, when an IBM computer couldn't talk to a uh, digital equipment computer, again, ancient history, IBM found themselves uh, essentially out of business. When cell phones continue to rely on, you know, if you're a subscriber to our phone service, you can't talk to the other people. Oftentimes those companies either, either responded to change, but they were behind the curve or they actually went out of business. Okay. Hopefully that makes some sense. Um, and we've got lots of paradoxes we can talk about as well. <laughs> Pete, do you want to continue for a little bit and then we'll bring up a few more questions at the end or do you want to keep going with questions? I think uh, if, if, if we have questions, I'd prefer to respond to those questions at this point, Vicki. Okay. Uh, Bob Hanna has one. He says, do you have any recommendations for breaking bad news to Model 1 leaders? I want to say hi to Bob. He's also one of our past participants of both engineering leadership and certificate and executive management. So let's, let's st restate that again now. Do you have any recommendations for breaking bad news to Model 1 leaders? Uh, well, um, let's understand that the, the Model 1 leader is probably not going to be critically reflective about their behavior. Okay, now sometimes that's not intended to be mean-spirited. Um, you see what I'm saying? It may just be the absence of self-awareness and critical self-reflection. 
and that would be you know that that would be the the best possible scenario in this circumstance you're describing in other cases people are, are frightened and so they resort to model one because they don't want people to realize that they don't have a clue as to what they're doing and so walking into it uh, understanding that the other person's predisposition might be one of an adversary which means that they want to protect themselves and thinking through the ways that we can understand that is i think what we do is we predicate our conversations with uh with an, a, a sincere desire on your part to understand their point of view uh help them understand that you recognize they may not see it the way the same way you do give them an opportunity to respond at that moment in time because if they push back or whatnot you may want to just back off but but if they're if they're uh, honest in, the, in their own mind's eye. At some point, they're going to say, why are you asking these questions? And so your next statement would be, well, I, I need to give you some information here that you may not find to be uh, something that's it's, uh, pleasing or even acceptable, but I think it's really important for you to know it at this, need, need to know it at this point in time. They'll, their interest will perk at that moment in time, and you can say, but I want you to understand I'm doing this for this reason, and that is I'm sincerely interested in us seeing something or you understanding something that may not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, fit into your mind's eye or, or your view of the world. And is it okay if I tell you that, recognizing that I expect that maybe you'll reject this or push back? And that, that sounds, that's a long preamble, but what you're essentially trying to do is tune them in and disarm them as well. And sometimes I think of it in the context of a, you know, a radio from the last century. And for those of us old enough to remember radios where you just, you had to tune them in and you know, there was a knob there and based upon how well you could tune it and how strong the signal set the strength was, you actually got people to the point where they could hear it loud and clear. That's where loud and clear actually comes from. And so what your, your preliminary work with a model one leader or person in this case is to make sure that they're tuned in and they're listening and you've got kind of a high fidelity signal and then you, then you help them understand that what you're going to tell them may not be uh, something they want to hear or pleasing to them or something they may reject. And at any point in time, if they push back, then you can just back off and maybe try again at a different point in time. Now, last but not least, um, you don't want to go model one on them because all that does is create difficulty and you know frustration and dysfunction going forward. So. Uh, seek to understand and to be understood, I guess is what I'd say. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Uh, thank and, you, Pete. Uh, Kitty, I'm happy about the guard working at the food bank. If anybody knows how to do stuff on a large scale, it's gonna be those folks. Other thoughts, Vicki, or observations from other Q&A? Yeah, uh, Matt Gregg has a, a comment here. The source of the criticism should be taken into consideration as well. If you think about COVID-19, an expert in the medical community doesn't have to be open to receive criticism from individuals with zero experience or knowledge <laughs> of the medical field. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, well, you know, one, one, one person's expert is another person's foil, I guess, in this particular <laughs> case. But I appreciate your, your comment very much. Once again, when we talk about authority, sometimes expertise is a level of authority. But if, if people are inclined to compromise expertise, then, then everything is up in the air at that moment in time. And then we fall back to this issue of who do you trust? And of course, that's, that's a dilemma. Uh, I, would, I would observe that our best course is to trust people to tell the truth. Mm. Uh, Nancy Leahy uh, was a participant in Certificate 2018. Hi, Nancy. So glad you're here. Uh, this is a youth-focused question. Nonprofit workers are in disagreement over fundraising for anything but medical and food. Uh, children's educational programs are being postponed by some or silenced by others. I believe we should keep fundraising for children's learning and lifestyle. Do you have thoughts on this disagreement? Well, um, I think in some cases, Nancy, what you're describing is tunneling on the part of some of those organizations. You know, because this is what we do and we're gonna have to focus our energies and we don't wanna create uh, an absence of focus or confuse people that might be able to provide us financial support in this particular case. 
But if we look, if you will, at, at the gestalt of the problem, and even link, you know, raising uh, funds for food and whatnot, is it? I, I wish I had this statistic at hand, but how many kids are on, on uh, free and reduced lunch when they go to school? And of course, not going to school means that it might be uh, in a, a de deprived situation of even getting regular meals at this moment in time. And that's not a comment about getting kids back to school. It's a comment about making sure that we deal with, with the fundamental issues of care for our young people. Okay, and the rest of it follows from there. But I would advocate that to our colleagues in the not-for-profit area, they, they start thinking about the whole problem as opposed to focusing prematurely on part of the problem. Um, and I and you may be able to open up that conversation with them based upon that, you know, that leverage point about where how are kids going to get fed. And that may be a point that would be well or well uh, well served introducing to the conversation or just ask questions right thank you pete uh, matt greg has uh, another comment here when your staff has been with the company almost as long as you've been alive the change management is more difficult any advice on getting them out of the that's what we've always done it mentality and adapting to change and technology yeah I guess the I, I, I've been through that circumstance on a number of uh, occasions, Matt, in my, uh, in my experience. Um, and as uh, your point is well taken, I've been in situations where uh, some people have been in the job longer than I've been alive. So if we strip away the idea of past experience, always being able to inform future behavior, and if we uh, resort to some of those comments that I made in that that model about openness and honesty and free and informed choice and advocacy. What I've concluded is if we, if we treat people with respect and honor their past performance and certainly celebrate the expertise they bring to the work that they do and set that up as the kind of the foundation of your conversation going forward. So, you know, sidebar is sometimes a, a young person comes in saying, well, this is the way it has to be. And they're rejected out of hand because they don't have any cred, basically. They're not trusted. But if we honor and respect the past practice and contribution people made, and then ask them sincere questions about what do you perceive the future going forward, you know, thoughtful people among them are going to say, well, uh, I'm not really sure. So I'm just kind of hunkering down right now. I'm going to weather the storm or whatever it might be. And hopefully it's not some kind of a catastrophic event. But in this particular case, part of foresight would be what might happen if you know, what we're doing right now doesn't exist anymore? And you know, what might happen if uh, all of a sudden technology has a bearing on how people are going to do work? And I'm going to suggest that in, in so many uh, circumstances, had people thought through that, it, they would have prepared experienced uh, contributors to embrace and adopt new behaviors and new practices going forward, and they would have been successful in doing so. But it's, it starts with this honest and authentic conversation with folks. And it may well be, you know, you've been doing this job longer than I've been alive. So I've got some things to learn here. Can we talk about it? And by cre creating that environment where you can have honest conversations about things with great respect to the other person, disarm yourself, those, those types of things. Not to always loop back to this particular presentation, but some of the lessons that I've tried to illustrate here for you may inform that behavior is that you can you know, certainly can at least get them engaged. Also recognize this, generally people when they hunker down are scared. And the uncertainty of what the future might bring is something that would be worthwhile talking about as well. Um, and if, if nothing more, you can say, you know, if, if, uh, if everything stopped at this moment in time, not that that's an unreasonable <laughs> assumption, how might we deal with the future based upon constraints that would be imposed from circumstances we can't control? I'm thinking of restaurants right now, for example, um, the dine-in restaurant versus the, the restaurant was able to pivot to carry out and how they were responsive to the nature of the situation. But yet yeah, what's underlying it is all those men and women that made their living as servers in restaurants. And had we been able to anticipate, uh, perhaps we would have had different alternative responses for those people as well. Hopefully that's a reasonable response to your question. I guess we've got a couple minutes left. Um, Vicki, is that true? That is true. Okay. Um, folks, it's, a, it's an honor and a, and a privilege to spend time with you. Um, the fact that you're willing to participate in our conversation is, is a testimonial to your foresight. 
because you're hopefully you're looking at and inquiring about situations that you might engage in that will help you prepare for the future. It's oftentimes just quiet behavior, thinking about the what if scenario, but your personal example of inquiry, which means that you're not afraid to ask the questions about uncertain situations or, or challenging situations will also be a model for your folks as well. And they'll be more inclined to, to work successfully with you in this process of trying to develop, how are we gonna to respond to situations that are uncertain that we cannot predict, but we gotta get ready. We should be always prepared. So thanks again for the opportunity to spend time with you, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's a delight. Um, and maybe someday we'll play football again, who knows? <laughs> Go Irish. Go Irish. <laughs> Pete, thank you so much for spending your uh, time with us. Uh, those of you who are enrolled in Module 1 of Certificate Executive Management will be doing our uh, Zoom video chat tomorrow at 4. And if there are others of you on the call right now who would like to join us, we would be glad to have you. Uh, send me an email, vmaris at nd.edu, and I'll send you the join link for that Zoom meeting if you would like to be a part of that. It's a more intimate conversation where we are all on camera. I would like to challenge each of you who are still on the call to pick something that you have learned today from Pete or from our interaction around the questions that have been asked and teach it to someone else. Uh, te teach it to your family, one of your family members. Uh, get on a little video and teach it in LinkedIn. Share it with someone else. That will help us extend the reach of our webinar effort here today, but it also helps the learning sink in for you when you look back through your notes and pick something that's resonating with you that you think you can put into play in your work as a leader and share it with somebody else. Thank you for being here today. Adios. Thank you, Pete.